Uh, OXTS makes inertial navigation systems. And fundamentally, that means combining a GNSS receiver with an inertial measurement unit uh, through something called an extended Kalman filter to provide you a time, position, and orientation at any given moment. And you can see on the right-hand side, that's an example of one of our new products. Uh, it's an OEM chip called the X-Red 3000 that we're launching at this show. Uh, and kind of the aim of um, OXTS is to navigate anywhere. Thank you very much. Um, and the problem with, with this fundamental hard, hardware setup is it only takes you so far before you end up with expensive IMUs, extremely expensive IMUs, uh, export controls getting in the way, uh, as well as size constraints. We've all seen a big fog IMU that's an enormous chunk. Uh, and fundamentally, IMUs drift over time. So if I lose GNSS, I will always drift. Uh, so what can we do to combat that by, by navigating anywhere? Uh, or to navigate anywhere, I should say. Well, we need to find uh, another way. And the way that OXTS is choosing to do that is through sensor fusion, so which brings us on to the agenda for this presentation. Um, so first of all, I'm going to explain what sensor fusion is and exactly specifically what LIO is. Um, I'm going to explain why you would use um, why you use LIO, what's the point of it, what, in what scenarios do we really see uh, a difference in, in the data it produces, and then finally, how good is it? So how have we validated its performance? So first of all, what is LIO? LIO, or OXTS LIO, if we're, if we're choosing the, the correct marketing term, uh, stands for LIDAR Inertial Odometry. So if we break down what each of those components are, you are at a geospatial show, everyone knows what a LiDAR is. It's a laser scanner. Uh, inertial, this is uh, an accelerometers and gyroscopes that tell me how my movement is changing. And then odometry is just um, uh, how my position moves over time. So we're using LiDAR in combination with accelerometers and gyroscopes uh, to provide uh, a velocity update effectively into our INS. And how are we implementing it? Well, this is the fundamental OXTS hardware um, block diagram, system diagram. Uh, we have our IMU data and our GNSS data that's getting fed into our processing engine. And out the back, we're getting localization data. And what we've implemented in the last few years is something called a generic aiding interface. And this allows us to put in uh, different updates from different sensors, uh, whether they provide position, a velocity, or an attitude update into our INS. Because sensors we're using don't always provide the best uh, type of input, uh, given uh, the environment that you're in. So if we remove that, how, if we're talking about LIO specifically, what are we doing? We're taking data from our IMU. We're integrating that with our LiDAR data uh, in our OXTS LIO software. And then we're providing uh, a generic aiding data or GAD data packet into our INS, um, which contains a high accuracy, velocity, and angular rate updates. So why use LIO? What the hell is the point of it? Why, why can't I just use an INS? Um, and I'll explain this in terms of um, GNSS. So when we have no GNSS obstructions, there's no reason to use anything other than GNSS and an IMU uh, integrated together to give you time, position, and uh, attitude updates. However, when we enter the second of these two scenarios, we go into urban canyons. This is where we're relying more on our IMU. Um, and then finally, we have complete GNSS obstructions, which um, uh, GNSS just cannot penetrate whatsoever. So we're never getting a full, accurate, uh, global position update. And you, the, when you're on the left-hand side, we can achieve good global position quite easily. We're on the right-hand side, going by a SLAM system, you can achieve relative accuracy quite easily. What is difficult is finding a good global position for areas where you have poor GNSS. And that's the reason for, for integrating a different type of sensor 
into uh, an INS system. So here's where, where I live in London. Uh, it's got a lot of buildings in it, got a lot of very narrow streets. The GNSS coverage is particularly poor. Uh, and I'm going to show you a data collection that we did with one of our INSs. Uh, it's a Quad Constellation INS, uh, coupled with running LIO through a HESI XT32. Uh, and we've done eight laps around the city of London, which is a very built-up environment. And this white trace is what uh, a loosely coupled GNSS and IMU uh, combination produces in terms of positional output. Um, you can see areas where we have good RTK updates over here by, um, by bank. Uh, we, can, we can maintain position rather well. But we go in past here, past the Gherkin, and we start to drift by meters. For a mapping application, this is uh, unusable. But when we add in LiDAR odometry, it provides a very complementary error profile compared to GNSS. It works in environments where we have a lot of features around us to pick out scans from. Uh, we're keeping position for eight laps. So this is about an hour and 10 minutes worth of data. Uh, and we are never receiving particularly good position updates inside, inside there. Uh, but we're keeping on track for, for the entirety of that time. Again, another example is in San Francisco, a lot of tall buildings. Uh, similar setup here with uh, one of our new INSs. Uh, Mission Street is one of the two worst streets in San Francisco for um, GNSS. And this is what our INS looks like. Uh, the, white, um, the white trace, when we stop for a prolonged period of time, we, uh, we start to drift. And it may look like quite a small drift there, maybe a few meters. But what we don't see is the drift in altitude that we get, which is shown by the point cloud over here. So we have good data going into, going into the particularly poor GNSS period. And then we have that long stationary update. Um, and then we get a, a mishmash afterwards that's no use. We apply LIO, and we're suddenly uh, be able to pick out features. We're not drifting in altitude uh, over time. Uh, and that's the, the output. We're generating a much cleaner point cloud. And again, an example of a kind of completely GNSS denied environment, or only getting spurious GNSS signals kind of through the sides of a wall, very low altitude. On the right-hand side, we have a, uh, a top-down image of the car park. And we can see how the layers don't really align perfectly. You can tell there's drift in there. And once we apply LIO, drift reduces, and we generate a good-looking point cloud. And all the, the levels align. And then finally, in San Francisco, this is not so much a, a position a improvement, but we can see we're, we're going down the tunnel. We have some slightly fuzzy railings on the right-hand side. And this is just to say that LIO can also give you small heading pitch and roll improvements, which is shown by uh, the, kind of the cleaning up of the point cloud that you can see here. And again, another car park example. We're inside for 470 seconds which for any other MEMS-based INS, which is, I mean, MEMS is uh, a relatively cheap technology compared to what you'll see here. Um, we're inside for 470 seconds, which would normally be curtains for us. Um, but we apply LiDAR odometry. We can see that over 470 seconds, we're only drifting by 0.88 meters compared to 100 meters beforehand. So finally, I'll just show you some of our, how we're validating this. Um, this is near where we're based in Oxford. Um, we've done seven laps of, of this area. Um, the, store, the buildings around us are maybe three or four stories tall. Our INS can cope fine with these, um, these scenarios normally. Uh, there's not an issue. But we can blank the GNSS artificially for a, an amount of time, and we can test how good the drift is over time, the positional drift, uh, which you can see on the right-hand side. So we've done seven laps of, of the Ashmolean uh, with blank 60-second uh, periods throughout that entire data set to do our, our cross-validation on untested data. And then we produce this on the right-hand side, which shows how, um, how different data runs are, uh, um, how the drift is reduced. You can see over 60 seconds, we're going down to kind of an average of about 
10 to 15 centimeters of positional drift over 60 seconds, which is far better than any MEMS-based INS can achieve. And if you're particularly interested in the numbers, feel free to take a picture of this. Uh, but the ones I'll draw attention to are position error, our 2D position error, after uh, an amount of time. 60 seconds is, is uh, normally what we look at. We're going from 88 centimeters, unaided, no wheel speed sensor, uh, down to 22 centimeters, LIO aided, again, no wheel speed sensor. Uh, and this just showing how in areas where we have good physical features around us, but very poor GNSS, uh, how much we're able to improve the uh, positional output of our systems. And probably the, the, the most important thing here, if you look at uh, percentage of error compared to 3D distance traveled, uh, uh, how much that reduces. We go from 0.23% uh, um, uh, percentage error of distance traveled down to 0.03%. So it really is quite a big jump. And we're taking technology or um, cheaper technology, more, more cost-effective technologies, and then achieving performance of much higher grade INS systems that you might see on the market for, for hundreds of thousands of pounds. Um, so all that remains to say is thank you very much for listening to me. Sorry about the clicker earlier on. Um, but our booth is just around the corner. So if you want to speak to me or one of the team, feel free to come and do that. Thank you very much.